I'm really excited to be sitting here this morning with Guy Kawasaki. I followed Guy for a number of years. Uh, my first introduction to him was in reading the book Selling the Dream, and then I got to hear him speak on that topic, and I was an instant fan. And since that time, I've read The Art of the Start and Rules for Revolutionaries, and he's got a brand new book that I just read over the weekend called Enchantment, The Art of Changing Hearts, Minds, and Actions. Good to meet you finally, Guy. All right. Good to meet you. Good to meet you. Well, how would you define enchantment? You talk about that in the book. Yep. How do you define it? I think enchantment is the process of developing this deep, delighted, delightful relationship with people so that you can change their hearts, minds, and actions, uh, as the subtitle says. And it means that you create something that's long-lasting and mutually beneficial. Um, it's, it's different than just trying mm. to you know, bludgeon someone or just influence a person or persuade a person for a single transaction. It's much more long-lasting. So it's something where they want to have the relationship with you. Yes, uh, yeah. Yeah, and the perfect example, of course, is Apple, right? I mean, Apple enchants you to buy a Macintosh, then an iPhone, and an iPod, an iPad, an iTunes, iBooks. I mean, it's i everything. Whereas other computer companies, they just try to get you to buy, you know, that laptop once. They have some serious magic going on because I'm totally yeah. addicted. I can't walk in the <laughs> store without walking out with something. <laughs> Could, can you give us an example of enchantment? Yeah, uh, I'll, I'll take you to a real like non-technical, non-consumer example. Perfect. Uh, there's a woman named Karen Mueller, and she was a Peace Corps volunteer living in the Philippines, and she heard uh, that through the grapevine that these um, these people were going to come and sort of threaten her and you know intimidate her in this jungle sur surrounding. And what she did instead is she collected coffee and sugar during the day, knowing that they'd coming back. And when they came back, rather than you know um, them threatening her. What she did is she said, oh, come into my hut and have some coffee mm. and sugar with me. And that completely changed the relationship from intimidation and fear and, you know, possible violence and God knows what to one of more cordial, you know, discussion and meeting people. So that's a case where she enchanted those people. She changed those people's hearts, minds and certainly actions. Yeah, that's such a good example. I, I loved it right there at the first of the book. Uh, why is enchantment so important? I mean, writing a book's a lot of work. It was a lot yeah. of work to write this one, I'm sure, and you felt that this was very important, but why? Well, I, I think, you know, I've been trying to evangelize or enchant people for about 30 years now, starting mm. with Macintosh, really, and I've learned one thing that, ironically, if you think about it, you would hope that the more innovative and more creative and more revolutionary the thing is that you have, the easier it would be. People would beat a path to your door. I found that to be quite the opposite. Hmm. And so enchantment is truly necessary when you have something innovative, when you're trying to go up against the status quo, when you're trying to defy the crowd. Um, you need to take people beyond this transaction and help them internalize your values and see you know, how you see the world and how... A Macintosh could increase people's creativity and productivity. Mm -hmm. A Zappos can increase people's happiness. A Virgin America can provide an airline that you enjoy flying on. Um, those are bigger challenges. Yeah, and that kind of relates directly to the uh, chapter that you have about likability. And, and how is that related to enchantment? Well, if you think about it, you know, have you ever been enchanted by someone you didn't like? Uh, the answer yeah. is probably no. no. So the keys to likability are some real fundamentals. Uh, that you smile when you meet people and you don't just smile with your jaw but you use your eyes too so you want crow's feet crow's feet is good yeah I like that yeah you um, also have to have a good handshake not too long not too short mm -hmm. not too firm not wet uh, looking the person in the eye having that smile it's called a Duchenne smile where you use both your eyes and your jaw uh, so that's a second part and the third part of likability is that you dress for a tie as opposed to win Hmm. Uh, basically, when you meet people, you know they can be dressed way above you, and you kind of get the message that they want to show off that they have more mm -hmm. money or better taste. They can be dressed way beneath you, and I think the message there is, you know, I'm so much more powerful than you. I can do whatever I want. You hmm. you have to wear a suit. I can wear a t-shirt and jeans. So the right place to dress is equal. So but, really, you know, the goal is to make the other person comfortable. Yeah. Kind of forget about yourself. Yes. Well, you, you said in the book that likability is kind of half the equation and the other yes. half is trust. So could you talk about trust and enchantment yes. a little bit? Uh, the reason why likability is only half the equation is because 
you can like somebody and not trust them. Uh, good example last night is the Academy Awards, right? There's many celebrities and, mm -hmm. and movie stars that you'd like, but not necessarily trust for advice. So I think the key to trustworthy is that first, you have to trust others before they trust you. Uh, this is not a chicken or egg problem. This is a very, very specific direction. You trust people, they will trust you. Zappos mm. trust people, and therefore they trust Zappos. I mean, Zappos started that kind of relationship. A uh, second thing is that you have to default to a yes attitude, which means that when you meet people, you should always be thinking, how can I help this person? Mm -hmm. As opposed to how can this person help me? What is this person trying to do to me? Uh, a yes attitude sort of uh, opens you up for many more possibilities. Yeah, I like and then that. You should, you should think like a baker, not an eater. A baker sees a pie and wants to get as big a slice as possible. Did I say that wrong? I think you said it backwards. <laughs> yeah, yeah. At least I caught it. You know, it's early here. An eater sees a pie and wants to eat as much as he or she can. A baker wants to create a bigger pie or more pie so that everybody wins. I love that. Bakers are trusted. You know, one of the things that uh, it seems like that every person who's committed to enchantment or creating that experience is going to face is resistance, and you have a whole chapter on that. And I certainly noticed in my own leading and in people that I know that are entrepreneurs they face this uh, phenomenon of resistance. Talk about how you deal with it in the book, because I think you do a great job. Well, uh, you know, one of the keys to dealing with resistance, first of all, is to be likable and trustworthy yeah. and have a great product. That Don't get me wrong, that really helps. Uh, but then there are definitely some techniques, such as social proof. Uh, social proof means that, mm. you know, when you see a lot of people wearing white earbuds, after a while yeah. you figure out, oh, they're all wearing iPods. And the, the mental calculation is lots of white earbuds equals lots of iPods. iPods must be good. I'll buy an iPod. Then there's more white earbuds in the world, so then people buy more iPods, and it becomes this upward spiral. Uh, social proof is a very powerful way to break down resistance. Well, you talk about so many wonderful examples in that chapter, and people just have to read the book uh, to find it. But I, I <laughs> underline so many things and clip so many things to Evernote because I know I'm going to use them and I'm going to actually give you credit the first couple of times and then they're my own. <laughs> well, thank you. But, uh, thank you. Evernote well, is a great tool. I mean, I'm <laughs> conflicted. I'm an advisor to the company. But yeah, I run my life on Evernote. Evernote and Dropbox. Wow. No, I, I use the, t the same two things and they're fantastic. Yeah. Hey, one last question. Um, you know, inevitably, enchantment becomes disenchantment. Maybe not inevitably, but the fizz can go out of the pop. How do you make it endure? You make it endure by trying to help people internalize your values. That, uh, you know, Apple tries to make people internalize the value of being more creative and more productive. Again, so it's not simply a mm. transaction. It's not simply buy this gadget. Uh, I think you also do things like uh, the Grateful Dead. And there's a great example. The Grateful Dead has been enchanting people for generations mm -hmm. now. And one of the things they do, which is contrary to what most bands do, is they have a special section for tapers. Mm. Of course, nobody uses tape anymore. And at a concert, at a Grateful Dead concert, there's a place where they set up the ability for people to record the concert for non-commercial use. So they're essentially Amazing. encouraging people to copy their music and send it to their friends, which is shall I say, 180 degrees of, you know, different from most music groups. Totally different. But that's the yeah. kind of thing that makes your, your enchantment endure. Yeah, that's, that's a fantastic example, and there's a lot more in the book. I, I appreciate you spending a few minutes with it, and I would just encourage my readers, buy this book and read it. I think it will really challenge your thinking. There's news you can use, uh, and this book will enchant you. And that's the name well, of the thank book. <laughs> Thanks, Guy. Thank you very much.